do remember in prayer the Reverend McLeod uh, from our Sharkin congregation in the passing of his mother, and we pray that God will comfort and sustain them even at this time. Let's open our Bibles together, please. We're turning in our Bibles to the 37th Psalm, and we read some verses from this passage of God's Word, and uh, we're going to commence reading there at the verse number 27 of the 37th Psalm, verse 27. And in this uh, 37th Psalm here, we uh, read the instruction of God. It says, Depart from evil and do good, and dwell forevermore. For the Lord loveth judgment, and forsaketh not his saints. They are preserved forever, but the seed of the wicked shall be cut off. The righteous shall inherit the land and dwell therein forever. The mouth of the righteous speaketh wisdom, and his tongue talketh of judgment. The law of his God is in his heart, and none of his steps shall slide. That's pure wisdom, and may God bless his word to our hearts. Let's just bow our heads in prayer. Let us seek God's face at the throne of grace in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank thee once again for thy precious and thine infallible word. We thank thee that thy word is true and thy word is forever settled in heaven. That though heaven and earth may pass away, that thy word shall never pass away. And I pray that thou will bless thy word now to our hearts and as we meditate upon it. Lord, we pray that we might be instructed afresh in thy word. Help us to live lives that are holy. Help us to live lives that are well-pleasing. Uh, those that know and love Jesus, that we will walk worthy of our calling in Christ Jesus. We pray for any this morning that know not the Savior. Lord, thou knowest that our heart's desire and prayer for them is that they might be saved and that they might know the joy of sins forgiven. They might know the peace of God, uh, which passeth all understanding of walking in the will of God and, accord, and in accordance to the word of God. And so bless us as we wait in thy presence and do us good. And Lord, just touch us afresh. Uh, for we pray in Jesus' precious name and for Jesus' sake. Amen. Now, last Lord's Day, we were thinking together about the compensations of the godly man. And as we were thinking about that, we noted that little verse there in verse number 27, which we commenced to read. It says, Depart from evil and do good and dwell forevermore. In other words, God's children must never yield to temptation. It's not that we don't be tempted, but we must not yield to the temptation to do evil just to achieve earthly prosperity or to achieve the things that the wicked obtain. Uh, but there are the great compensations for the child of God that we need to rejoice in and we need to dwell upon. And there in verse number, uh, last Lord's Day, we looked at verse 29, it said, The righteous shall inherit the land and dwell therein forevermore. And thank God we have an inheritance within our hands or within our grasp. Now David acknowledges that the riches of the people of God really have, uh, is a reality because we have an inheritance. It talks about an inheritance. And of course, Whenever we think about the inheritance of the child of God, First Peter in chapter 1 tells us about the inheritance that we have that is incorruptible, that is undefiled, that fadeth not away. You see, all the inheritance or all the prosperity of the ungodly, friend, it can disappear. There were men that were millionaires, and let me tell you, they have nothing anymore. It just passed away nearly overnight. And uh, their hearts are broken because of those things, because that's what their lives were built upon. That's the inheritance that they, that they had, and that's what they thought about. It was just earthly prosperity. But thank God we have a great inheritance, and we have a better land. And we need to focus ourselves upon what we have in Christ. And thank God then, even though things of earth uh, grow strangely dim, and even the things that we have of earth fade away and corrupt and pass away. Thank God we don't lose our joy because our joy is deeper than that. Our inheritance is far greater than that. And then notice not only have we the compensation of having an inheritance within our hands, but we have instruction on our lips. 
Look at verse number 30. And this is where we want to look at the, especially the first part of the verse this morning. It says this, The mouth of the righteous speaketh wisdom. The mouth of the righteous speaketh wisdom. Thank God we have instruction on our lips. Now, I just mentioned before I closed last Sunday morning, and I made a statement, we often are known by the language of our lips. I remember I was in the States, and I was in this little 7-Eleven, and I heard these two people speaking. And I must be honest, when I heard them speaking, I knew they were from nowhere else but from Northern Ireland, because nobody speaks like us. And so therefore, whenever I went around, I couldn't believe it, two people that, that I knew from Belfast, and there they were, standing on the other side, but I knew them by their speech. I knew them by what they said. Now, the Word of God says here, the mouth of the righteous speaketh wisdom. Uh, you know, there is a, a, a great spiritual index of how we speak. I said last Lord's Day morning that on many occasions, doctors they were able to discover sickness by saying, open your mouth. And they look into your mouth, and somehow they're able to discover. Now, I can tell you, we could look into people's mouths and discover nothing. But nevertheless, they are able to discover something. Now, the Word of God says here, the mouth of the righteous speaketh wisdom. So therefore, there is a spiritual index concerning what we say. And that is vital important. Now, turn just to the little book of Proverbs, just Psalms, Proverbs, and we come to Proverbs 10. And this is what the Word of God says concerning uh, the, 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 the mouth of the child of God. Proverbs chapter 10, in verse number 11. It says, The mouth of a righteous man is a well of life, but violence covereth the mouth of the wicked. Hatred stirreth up strifes, but love covereth all sins. In the lips of him that hath understanding, wisdom is found. But a rod is for the back of him that is void of understanding. Wise men lay up knowledge. But the mouth of the foolish is near destruction. Now, do you notice there in that passage of God's Word, there's the mouth of the wise man, and there is the mouth of the ungodly man. There is the, the, the mouth of the righteous man. Verse 11, the mouth of a righteous man is a well of life. And in verse, 13 it, uh, verse 14 it says, But the mouth of the foolish is near destruction. And so therefore, here is a spiritual examination of the mouth. Now when we think about the godly woman, for example, if you turn to Proverbs 31, and it speaks about the preciousness of the godly woman here, in verse number 10 of Proverbs 31, who can find a virtuous woman, for her price is far above rubies. And then if you go to verse 26, it says, She openeth her mouth with wisdom, and in her tongue is the law of kindness. And so we find that there is in the mouth of the child of God a great contrast between what the child of God speaks and what the child of God says and what is in the mouth of the child of God because it's a well of life. And it is this woman that is that godly woman. She opened her, her mouth with wisdom. And in her tongue is the law of kindness. But you see, the ungodly man, he is a foolish man, and therefore his mouth is near destruction. And whilst it's true, the ungodly are often loud talkers. And we could say loud-mouthed. In many ways, many of the ungodly and the wicked in this world today, and there will be many who will be drawn to them, and there will be many who wants to hear them, and they'll have a large audience. But when the child of God is speaking out of a well of life, 
there's few people who want to hear him. Have you ever tried to talk to a person? You can talk to them about the weather. You can talk to them about everything. And might they'll enter into a conversation with them. You start talking about the Lord. And friend, they don't want to hear you. They just don't want to know. But the child of God is speaking out of that well of life. And it is the most natural thing for the child of God to want to talk about his Lord. And about his master, you see, the foolish man has got plenty to say. But the wisdom of God is not in it. First Corinthians chapter 3. In First Corinthians chapter 3, it says in verse number 19, For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. Therefore let no man glory in men, for all things are yours. And it says there in that verse 19, For it is written, you say, well, where is it written? That's a statement from Job chapter 5, verse 13. It's written in the Old Testament. And so we find that here Paul is referring to the Scriptures when he says it is written. And he says the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. Human wisdom, in other words, is empty. And friend, human wisdom does not solve problems. In many ways, people following the wisdom of this world creates problems. But the wisdom of God, there's a great contrast. You see, in contrast with the conversation of the ungodly is the conversation of the child of God. But the conversation of the child of God is not often sought. But thank God we're compensated. Whilst the world doesn't want to know us. And whilst the world may not want to hear us, thank God what we have to say and what we talk about and what comes out of our mouths, it is heavenly wisdom. We are not given the wisdom of the world. We are given wisdom of God. And that might be foolishness to man because the wisdom of God is, is foolishness with man. But we have the wisdom of God. Now the Bible says, if any man lack wisdom... And every one of us have to admit this morning, we sometimes make foolish mistakes. And sometimes whenever perhaps we're trying our best to, to say things or to advise people, sometimes because we're relying upon the thoughts and the reasoning and the wisdom of man, we, 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 we say foolish things. And they would have been better never said. But of course, remember this, once they're said, they can't be taken back. Or at least they're hard to take back. And so there is the wisdom that we need in dealing with situations. I need wisdom as a preacher of the Word of God. You need wisdom in your Christian life. Now the Word of God says in James chapter 5, or 1 verse 5, it says, If any man lack wisdom, then let him ask of God. And I believe that that means that every one of us, because there's not one of us in the service today who knows the Lord, but lacks wisdom. We lack wisdom of ourselves, because the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. We need wisdom. We need wisdom to live right. We need wisdom to walk right. Friends, we need wisdom every day of our lives. People ask us, Questions. We need the wisdom of God. Now the word of God tells me, let him ask of God who giveth to all men freely. God gives it freely. You've got to ask him. And he obeyeth not. In other words, God won't deny you. If you ask God in faith believing, God will give you wisdom. The natural wisdom receives his knowledge or his wisdom from the natural man. Brother and sister, that won't do to live a godly life. In the book of James that I did quote a moment ago, in verse number, chapter 1, verse 5, turn to chapter 3 of the book of James. And it says this in verse 13. Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? 
an important question. Who is a wise man? People, you know, sometimes come to you and say, I know that you're a, a very wise person. And friend, they're buttoning you up usually because they're looking someone from you. But the Holy Ghost asks the questions, who is? Who is a wise man? And in Jude, with knowledge among you, let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. And you see, friend, let me tell you, it is not enough to have knowledge. We need the wisdom to use the knowledge correctly. You could be driving down the road in your car, and you look at your car, and you notice there in the petrol, we monitor there in your car, and it says that you're out of gas, or you're out of, you're out of petrol. Now, that's knowledge. But friend, that's not necessarily wisdom, because if you think you can drive on without putting something in, you'll find out you're stupid. Because, you see, wisdom will do something about it. Wisdom will manifest itself. The knowledge that you have, it's not enough. And there's many people, and their head's full of knowledge. But I'll tell you this. They don't walk with knowledge. And they don't walk with wisdom. And if you talk to them, they are just a, 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 they are a pool of knowledge. And I can tell you, when they open their mouth, instead of knowledge... Instead of wisdom, it's knowledge, but they don't put it into practice. You see, knowledge of itself is not enough. We need the ability to use that knowledge correctly. And that's wisdom. Wisdom, which comes alone from God. God can give us wisdom to live our lives in accordance to his precious word and glorify and honor his name. You see, in the book of Proverbs chapter 4, verse 7, it says, Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. Get it. And with all thy getting, it says, get understanding. How important it is. People just, you know, read the verse about wisdom and just pass it over deliberately. The Holy Ghost says, with all thy getting, because wisdom's the principal thing. And God has promised to give it to you. It's a gift. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God. Now, I said there's a difference as the wisdom of this world. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, in the verse 20, it says this, Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. So don't confuse knowledge with wisdom. The world by wisdom. Wisdom. you not God. See, natural wisdom. Natural wisdom. That's why we've got to ask of God. We need the wisdom which is from God because natural wisdom knows not God. The natural mind won't follow God. The natural man will go on. Listen, a non of man knows that word, God's word says that at the end of the journey there's hell. And he knows if he dies in a sin, he's lost in a, in a sin. He knows he's going to a Christless eternity. But he doesn't know anything about it. Because the wisdom of the world knows not God. That's why we need the intervention of the Holy Ghost. That's why I need God's wisdom. That's what I pray. Oh God, please open their eyes. Let them see their lost estate. Let them see the beauty and the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when a sinner realizes that Christ did not come to destroy our lives, Christ come to give us life and to give us it more abundantly. And that oh, that they might see the beauty and the glory and the wonder of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, wisdom of itself, of man, is not the answer. It's the wisdom of God. Let him ask of God. Now let's go back in our Bibles again to James chapter 3 a moment. I want to develop this because it's important. 
If you look there in verse 15 of James chapter 3, this wisdom, that's speaking about man's wisdom. This is the natural wisdom. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthy, sensual, devilish. I think that's interesting, the threefold description here. It is sensual. It is natural. It's that which comes from man's fallen nature. I see there, in actual fact, those three words, earthy, sensual, and devilish. I see the three, the three enemies of the Christian. It says earthy, that's the world. Sensual, that's the flesh. Devilish, that's the devil. And the world and the flesh and the devil, friend, that's the enemy of God. That's the enemy of God's child. And so the wisdom of this world may satisfy the world. In other words, it's worldly thinking. My, that's what the world wants to put into the child of God's heart. What the world thinks. And sadly, not only is that happening, putting it into the heart and minds of the child of God, friend, that's what the world says must be introduced to the church. Worldliness. I tell you this, my friend, the wisdom of this world descendeth not from above, it's not of God. And there is a challenge to God's people today, and it's a challenge to God's people even in simple things, and it is worldliness entering into the church. The mindset of the world to be like the world. People are wanting just to be like the world, dress like the world, and be like the world and look like the world. That's worldliness. The standards of God's Word has not changed because time has changed. The standards of God's book has not changed, brother or sister, in Jesus Christ. God's Word tells us we're not to be like the world. We're not to be conformed to the world. My, they want to squeeze you into worldliness. I want you to look like the world, just be like them. Just, and many people use this excuse, how about I'll be like them to win them? I want to tell you this, my friend. You don't win anybody by being like the world. There's nobody can change a man's heart, only the Spirit of God. It's only the Spirit of God can change a man's heart. That's nonsense. That you have to get down into the world and look like the world. And my, they dress like the world just to try to win the world. Tell me, friend, what would you be winning them to if you're looking like them? What are, you, what are you winning them from if you're wanting to be like them? The child of God should be different. The child of God is to live a separate life unto him. The wisdom descendeth not from above, it speaks here, but it's earthly, it's worldly, it's what the world thinks. And then it's fleshly. In other words, conforming to fleshly lusts. And God knows that every one of us, the old devil comes to try to make us crave after the lusts of the flesh. And then it says devilish. Friend, to be honest, that's the bottom line. Because the wisdom of this world is of the devil. It's of the devil. And you know that the, the, the scriptures contain many examples of the folly of the wisdom of man. For example, let me give it. The building of the Tower of Babel it seemed a wise enterprise by man, but it ended up in confusion and failure. It seemed to be wise for Abraham to go to Egypt to get food whenever there was a famine. But the results proved otherwise. It seemed a wise thing for King Saul to put his armor on young David as he was going out to face Goliath. 
friends, it wasn't. David had to throw the armor off and face him, the enemy, in the strength of the Lord. It seemed a wise thing for the disciples to dismiss the crowd, remember, whenever they followed the Lord Jesus and it was in evening time and there was no food. And so the disciples, they thought they were wise and they said, the master said, send them all away. That was the wisdom of man, friend. Jesus says, give ye them to eat. And the Roman experts in Acts chapter 27 thought it was wise to sail for Rome when Paul cried to them and pleaded with them not to. But they laughed at the servant of God and the boat was wrecked. And it was only the grace of God that brought them all safe to land. The wisdom that you and I need, friend, is wisdom from God. Look at verse 17 of chapter 3, James. But the wisdom that is from above. You see, there's two kinds of wisdom. The wisdom, verse 15, this wisdom descendeth not from above. It's devilish. But then there's the wisdom that is from above. Now, I want to show you, friend, very simply, as just very, and I know time is going so quickly, but we've got, we've got to deal with this. There are two things here. There's the emptiness or there's the folly of false wisdom. Notice what the Holy Ghost says. Let's go to verse 14 now. But if ye have bitter envying and strife in your heart, Glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and evil works. There's the folly or the fruit of false wisdom. Now, what is the fruit here? It says there in verse 14, if ye have bitter envying. And the thought there, bitter envying, is self-ambition. In other words, selfishness. Selfishness. Do you remember what the disciples had an argument about one day? Remember, the Lord Jesus came upon them and the disciples were arguing. One another. What were they talking about? Who would be the greatest? Who would be the greatest in the kingdom of God? They wanted to be the greatest. And friend, be honest. It's easy for each and every one of us, even as God's children, to go on an ego trip. That we want to be the greatest. Now the wisdom of the world, it exalts man, but it robs God of his glory. And that's what it said in 1 Corinthians when we were in chapter 1 and verse 29. No flesh should glory in God's presence. Verse 31, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. But the wisdom of the world glories in man. And it brings a selfishness to our hearts. It brings a thought of self-ambition. And that ponders and asks the question. Is my zeal spiritual or is it carnal? Friend, what it talks about, it's are my motives right? And the motives of the child of God is so important. Because if my motive is to exalt me, I want to tell you, it will not matter what I say, it's not of God. It's not how I present that. It's not of God. It's not from above. Because the word of God says that wisdom brings a better envying. And then notice the next word. Not only is there an envying here, but it brings a strife in your hearts. In other words, that's talking about a party spirit. 
And what the world's wisdom says is, listen, you get all the support you can get. And you get them gathered around you. Instead of God. Instead of the work of God. And what does the word of God say here? This strife in your hearts. And that's what it brings. It brings division. It brings a rivalry even among the people of God. And sad to say, one of the major problems amongst the children of God is this. Whenever strife or whenever rivalry comes in, one against the other, there is a division among the people of God. The Holy Ghost says, however, in Philippians chapter 2, Fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in loneliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. And brother, that's hard to do. That's not easy. Given place to another brother. And maybe you think it's your place. And the word of God says, esteem other better than themselves. And that takes lowliness of mind. We've got to be willing to take the lowly place. The flesh says no. Flesh says no. What does the flesh say? The flesh says, you gather them round you. Get you as many to gather round you. Get them supporting you. Let me tell you, my friend. The work of God is not of man. And it will never succeed by man. It must be of God. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. Now, go, let's go back here again. Verse 14, chapter 3 of James. But if ye have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not. What is that talking about? It's talking about the wisdom of man boasts. The wisdom of man says, be proud. Love yourself. Love yourself. Don't let put you down. Love yourself. You lift yourself up. Because quite honest, brothers and sisters, pride loves to boast. It loves to boast. You know, Paul, whenever he was writing to the church at Corinth, he acknowledged that quite often there's a mutual admiration society among God's people. In 2 Corinthians, he talks about it there in chapter 10. In verse 12, he says this, For we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. But we will not boast of things without our measure but according to the measure of the rule which God hath distributed to us, a measure to reach even unto you. And verse 17 says, He that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Oh, brother and sister, before God this morning, I need to catch this. You need to catch it that we don't count. It's only the Lord that counts. It's the Lord's glory. It's the Lord's work. It's the honor of our Savior that matters more than anything else. But the wisdom of man says, no, no, glory. But the Holy Ghost says, but if ye have bitter envying and strife in your heart, God says, boast not. And then says this, and lie not against the truth. It's quite, quite honest. Let's be, let's be blunt about it. Boasting about ourselves usually involves lies. 
we try to exalt ourselves that we, you know, will spread, will, will elasticate the truth. Because we want people to think better of us. We want people to really get in love with us. But the sad reality is this. There's sad consequences. For the word of God says, verse 16, and we've got to finish. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and evil works. There's the consequences of man's wisdom. Confusion. What does that mean? Instead of order among the people of God and that glorifying the Lord, because the Bible says we're to do everything decently and in order, it leads to confusion. And people don't know what to think and people don't know what to do. But not only confusion, it leads to every evil work. And all it does is encourage us sin. It condones evil. And it dishonors the Lord. That's the wisdom of the world, friend. That's what the world's wisdom will lead to. And if you try to bring the world's wisdom into the church of Jesus Christ, if you try to bring worldliness into the church of Jesus Christ, friend, that's what it'll lead to. It'll lead to confusion and every evil work. Pray earnestly. Please, God, protect your work. And no matter what man thinks, please, God, help us to plow a straight furrow. Help us not to deviate. Help us not to allow worldliness. Help us not to bring worldliness in to get the crowd. But help us to please the Lord. Because in all things, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God, where the Lord is glorified. Now the wisdom from heaven is different. We'll come on to that. And we'll just read it, and then we're through. Verse 17. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good works, without partiality, without hypocrisy. There is the wisdom of God, friend. That's the wisdom. That's the wisdom that's in the heart. With all thy getting, get wisdom. That's what the psalmist is leading us to. Whenever he talks about in Psalm 37, it tells us there, the mouth of the righteous speaketh wisdom. What's the fruit of that wisdom? Verse 17, 17 and 18. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them. That make peace. If any man lack wisdom, and I say, Lord, I do, and I'm earnestly asking, and I know you'll not deny me, but you give it this morning freely. And lastly, the wise man builds his house upon the rock. And that rock is Christ. Dear unsaved person this morning, come to Jesus. Come to Christ. Rest on him alone. And thank God you have the wisdom of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, bless thy word to our hearts. I thank thee and I praise thee this morning for thy precious word and I pray that please Lord that you'll give me that wisdom. I earnestly pray that. I pray that for my brothers and sisters in Christ this morning. Please give us godly wisdom. Help us not to listen to the wisdom of the world 
because the world will... Lord, it says, that wisdom is not from above, but it's earthy, it's worldly, it's fleshly, lusts, it's devilish, it's from hell. But, oh God, help us to have the wisdom that thou dost give. And help us to bear the fruit of that wisdom in our lives. That out of our mouth, out of our conversation, out of our daily living, we will show the world the wisdom of God. We pray in Jesus' precious name.